Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to start off by make, making sure to say thank you for staying for the last talk of the conference. I know it's been a long day full of fantastic content, and it can be draining, so thank you for still being here. I want to start off by saying that traits are awesome. They are one of my favorite things about the Rust language, but that said, when I was getting started with Rust, traits were hard to grasp at first. Did anyone else find traits a little hard to grasp at first? All right, we've got a few hands up here, that's good. I, I think this was particularly because I came from a traditional object-oriented language, which I'll talk a little bit of, uh, little more about a bit later. But I have good news for you today, and that is that despite them being a bit hard to get my head around at first, I have learned to harness the power of traits, and so can you. Now, before we dive into traits, let's briefly cover who I am. I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm a core maintainer of Habitat, which is written in Rust. I'm a senior engineer at Chef. I come from Seattle, Washington. Do I have any other Pacific Northwesterners here? All right, we got a couple of us. Good, good, the, the, long, the long flight crew. Uh, you can tweet at me at at Nell Shamrell, or feel free to email me at nshamrell at chef.io, and I will put these details back up at the end of this talk. Now, I've divided our journey today into three stages. The first is Traits 101. That's where we'll cover the basics of them, how you make them, how you use them, and then will come Traits 201, where we will discuss trait bounds and what that allows you to do. And then finally, Traits 301 will cover the world of trait objects and how they allow you to take your Rust code to new heights. So no matter where you are in your Rust journey, I think you'll get at least something out of each one of these, or out of one of these stages, if not all of them. And without further ado, let's dive into Traits 101. Now, one of my favorite analogies for programming is the game Dungeons and Dragons. It's a great model of a system that is defined by math with very clear rules, but there are infinite possibilities for creating adventures and experiences within these rules. Now, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons rules, there is one thing I want to make clear up front, and that is for any of my fellow gamers in the audience, <laughs> yes, I have simplified the rules of Dungeons and Dragons for this presentation. Now, I put this in because when I started writing this talk, I mentioned to some coworkers, oh, I'm thinking about using Dungeons and Dragons as an analogy for traits, which led into this very long conversation about, well, what part of D&D would be the best one for it? And then someone piped in with, nah, Dungeons and Dragons isn't the right system. We need to talk about GURPS or the magic system when we're talking about metaphors for Rust. So uh, while that was a fun conversation, the focus on this talk is traits with Dungeons and Dragons used as a metaphor. It's not meant to be a literal interpretation of the rules of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. <laughs> now with that on the, out of the way, let's go ahead and begin. In Dungeons and Dragons, you start a game by creating a character. And the first thing you select about that character is its race. There are nine to choose from. But in this talk, let's first focus on these four. A dwarf, an elf, a half-orc, and a human. So let's represent these by creating structs. In Rust, structs are a fantastic way to name and package together different values into a meaningful group. So we create a struct for a dwarf, we create one for an elf. Right now, the only field we're going to worry about is the name of the character. And then let's add in one for a half-orc and another struct for a human. So we've defined the races of Dungeons and Dragons as structs. Now, when I want to make a character, I can create an instance of one of these structs. So if I want to create a dwarf, I create an instance of the dwarf struct, and for now, we'll name it Nell Dwarf. So now that we have a basic character, we need to add certain traits to it. And every D&D character has six core traits. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Now for now, let's just focus on constitution. We have our dwarf character now, now we need a way of giving it a constitution. So to do that, let's make a trait, let's make a public trait, we'll call it constitution, and in this trait, we define one function, constitution bonus. Notice that we don't define how this function is carried out, we just define the name of it, what we expect passed to it, and the expected output, which in this case is a U8 number. 
So now that we have the trait defined, we need to implement this constitution trait on our dwarf struct. It should have all the functionality of this trait, but be able to override parts of it as needed. So this is how we implement the constitution trait for our dwarf struct. Now along with implementing this basic trait on it, we also need to define how this constitution bonus function works. And we remember, when we made this trait, we left exactly how this function works up to whatever struct implements this trait. So to implement this, we need to understand that the constitution bonus for a dwarf is two. That is common to any character that happens to be a dwarf. So that means if you're doing some sort of action where you need to roll the dice and score a certain constitution score, if you have a dwarf, you can always add two to it just by virtue of being of that race. So let's add this in and let's implement constitution bonus uh, for our dwarf. And we're gonna say it's going to return two whenever constitution bonus is called on an instance of the dwarf struct. So let's see this in action. Here I've got my character, it's a dwarf with the name of Nell Dwarf. And when I call constitution bonus on this character, it will return two. So I could create more implementations of the struct, more dwarf characters, and each one of them will return two whenever I call constitution bonus on them. Now that covers one of our structs. Let's take a look at one that might have a different constitution bonus, and that is the half orc. When I want to add a constitution to the half orc struct, I first implement it, and then remember, I also need to define the constitution bonus for that half-orc struct, which is different from a dwarf's constitution bonus. The constitution bonus for a half-orc is one. That means anytime you do a dice roll and you need to score a certain constitution, you can always add one if your character is a half-orc. So I have, they have this base constitution bonus, and I go ahead and implement that on my implementation of this trait for half-orcs, and this time it will return one. Now let's see this in action. Let's create a half orc called Nell Orc, and let's call constitution bonus on it. So when I call constitution bonus on any instance of the half orc struct, it will return one. Now there's two more races we need to implement a constitution for, the elf struct and the human struct. And these two actually have the same constitution bonus. If you're playing a half elf, if you're playing a human or a half elf or an elf, your constitution bonus will always be zero. So let's go ahead and implement this. We implement constitution for the elf and implement constitution for human. Now we could do it like this, defining the constitution bonus for both of them as zero, but this is pretty darn repetitive and it's not, not really what I like to see in my programming. Something to know is that most races have a constitution bonus of zero. It's an exception when something has a constitution bonus other than zero in Dungeons and Dragons. So let's go ahead and implement zero as the default for a constitution bonus. And we do that by going back to where we defined our trait and that constitution bonus function, and we say it will return zero. So unless a struct that implements this trait overrides the constitution bonus, it will always return zero. So let's see this in action and let's implement this on our elf and our human struct. And I'm going to need to implement the trait. I don't need to define how constitution bonus works because I'm using the default functionality of it, but I do still have to implement this trait on each of my structs. So let's create a, an elf, I'm gonna call this Nell Elf, and let's call constitution bonus on that, and that returns zero. Now let's create a human. And the human I'm just gonna call Nell, because although, if you can tell I play Dungeons and Dragons, whether I was human was up for debate in middle school, I, I'm pretty sure I'm a human, so I'm just gonna call my human Nell. And then I call constitution bonus on it, and it returns zero. So, at this point, yay, we have a trait, and we have a default functionality for that trait for the constitution bonus function, but we can always override it if we need to. Now that brings us to the end of traits 101, so let's dive right into traits 201, trait bounds. And again, we're using our Dungeons and Dragons metaphor, and this time I'm going to add another race. We've got our four core races right now. Let's add in a half elf.
Now, as you can see, the world of Dungeons and Dragons, it's a pretty diverse world. There's people with lots of different backgrounds and different races. They need a way to communicate. And part of creating your character is defining how that character can communicate with the outside world. So every race comes with some core languages that it already speaks. Dwarves speak common in Dwarvish, elves speak common in Elvish, and half-elves also speak common in Elvish. So let's focus on the Elvish language for right now, and let's make that a trait we can implement on our structs. So I create my Elvish trait, then I implement it on both my elf struct and my half elf struct. Both of these races speak elvish. Now let's make a function separate from our trait for allowing, or for allowing a character to take the action of speaking elvish. And let's define a function called speak elvish and we say it will return a string and let's say it returns the string yes. So right now, this function can be called on anything with no arguments. So let's narrow it down a bit. And let's say that we accept an argument called character, but that character does not need to be a specific type. It can be any kind of, it can be any of our structs that we've already created. So we have a generic type that we accept as an argument to this function. But we will only accept those types that implement the elvish trait. So if I run this method, I have my elf, and I run the met method speak elvish, passing it in my elf as an argument, remember, uh, my elf implements the elvish trait, so it will return yes. Now let's see this on the half elf. Pretty much the same, I create my half elf, and then I call my speak elvish function and pass it in that half elf as a uh, argument, and because my half elf does implement elvish, it returns yes. Now what if I pass it a different type of character? Let's say I create a half orc, and then I call my speak elvish function, and I pass it in my half orc as an argument. Well, as we can see, the elvish trait is decidedly not implemented for a half orc. Half orcs do not speak elvish by default. So in this case, when I try to compile my code, it will return an error on compile, letting me know that the trait Elvish is not implemented for a half orc. Now, one of the things I like about Rust is that so many errors like this return on compile. It doesn't give me a chance to try to run my code like this and possibly have a catastrophic error. So the thing to remember about trait bounds is that they allow a function to only accept types that implement a certain trait or that implement a certain combination of traits. You can have multiple, you can have multiple traits uh, that you can uh, keep as criteria for a function accepting. So that bring, that's the end of traits 201. Now let's move into traits 301, trait objects. And this is the really cool stuff. So this took me the longest to get my head around. Now in traditional object-oriented langu languages, I came to Rust from Ruby, Most, those of us who came from object-oriented languages are probably familiar with this concept of an object. An object holds both the data, the characteristics of an object, and the behavior, the methods you can call on that object to manipulate and use it. Now Rust does this a little differently. In Rust, we usually keep the data about something in an enum or a struct, and we keep the behavior in a trait. So the data and behavior are kept separately. Now that's one of the powers of Rust. We can kind of mix and match behavior as we need it in our code. But trait objects are also a little different. Trait objects behave more like traditional objects in that they contain both data and behavior, but it's still a little different from a traditional object. The way a trait object works is a trait object consists of a pointer to a value on the heap. The advantage of storing the value itself, the data, on the heap while keeping a pointer to it in the trait object is that even if the size of the value on the heap varies, the size of that pointer will always be the same. It makes it much more predictable for using this and dealing with memory. So that's the data of a trait object. The behavior of a trait object, how you can use it and manipulate it, comes from a traditional trait. 
Now, although a trait object does point to data on the heap, one thing it's critical to understand is that you cannot add data to a trait object. This is the key to understanding the purpose of trait objects and how to use them. We're pointing to the data at one specific point in time. Now let's go ahead and make some. So going back to our Dungeons and Dragons analogy, uh, if you are playing a magic class, let's say a wizard, they can cast spells, and there are several different types of spells you can cast. These include cantrips, transmutations, enchantments, and necromancy. Now there are more, but let's focus on these four for now. And let's create a cantrip struct, transmutation struct, enchantment struct, and necromancy struct that I can add behavior to. Now although these are different types of spells, the thing they have in common is that they all need to be cast, even if the specific way they are cast may differ from type of spell to type of spell. So let's make a trait. Uh, we're gonna call it our cast trait, and let's add in this cast function. And for now, we're not going to define a default behavior. We'll say any struct that implements this trait needs to define the behavior for the cast function. So I implement this cast for my cantrip, cantrip struct, and I override the cast function with whatever specific details are needed specifically for, for casting a cantrip spell. And then I do the same with my transmutation struct, implementing cast on it, then define whatever you need to do to cast a transmutation that might be different from casting a cantrip. And then finally, I do the same thing for enchantment. I implement it and detail how enchantments are cast. And then I do the same thing for the necromancy struct. So now each of these types of spells can be cast, but they are left to define anything specific about them that is required to cast that specific type of spell. So it's common in D&D to acquire a whole bunch of spells as you level up, and it's likely that my wizard or sorcerer will need a place to keep them, to kind of store them as we continue on our journey throughout whatever magical world we're exploring. So, where do we keep spells? In a spell book, of course, where we can easily find them and work with them. So let's represent this spell book as a struct. Let's create my spell book struct, and then I'm going to define a spells field for my spell book struct. So every spell book will have spells. Now the type of this field looks a little weird in the beginning, so let's go ahead and break it down. Spells feel, the spells field is a vector, and vectors are ways to group objects of a certain type. And the type we're grouping in our vector for spells is a box. And a box in Rust is a pointer to a value on the heap. Does this look familiar? The beautiful thing about, the, about using a box that contains that, that pointer to the value on the heap is again, the box's size is consistent in memory no matter what the size of the value on the heap is. Now we also, for boxes, we usually only contain values of a certain type. And in our case, we say that we can contain any type that implements the cast trait. It doesn't matter what type it is as long as it implements that particular trait. We can work with it if it does. So again, just to review, the spells field is a vector. That vector contains boxes, and those, box, that bo box, those boxes point to values that implement the cast trait. So let's take this a little further, and we're gonna veer a bit from the Dungeons and Dragons canon here, and let's say we want to cast all the spells in our spell book one after the other. We want kind of a rapid fire way to fire off all these spells as a collection. Well, we can do this in Rust by defining some behavior for our spell book struct through this implementation block. And what we're going to do is let's implement a function called run. And this function will take every spell in a spell book and iterate over it and cast the, each individual spell one right after the other. Remember, the types of spells themselves will define how they are cast, but the thing they all have in common is that they implement this cast trait and define that cast function. So let's look at a visual representation of this. We've got our wizard or sorcerer or whatever magical class you prefer, and he's going to call run on his spellbook, 
And that's gonna cast every spell in that spell book, no matter what type it is, one right after the other. So we've seen a visual, now let's see this in code. Let's uh, create a new instance of our spellbook struct, and let's define the spells. Remember, the spells field is a vector, and that vector contains boxes that contain different types of spells. Again, it doesn't matter what type of spell it is, as long as it implements that particular cast trait. So when I want to cast all of these one after the other, I can call the run method on my instance of the spellbook struct, and they will all be cast from this one function in whatever way is required for that type of spell to be cast. So what this highlights is that trait objects are great for heterogeneous collections, where we want to be able to have objects of different types stored in the same place. It doesn't matter what type those objects are as long as they all implement a certain trait. This gives you a lot of flexibility in your Rust code and allows you to be really dynamic with it. So that's Rust 301, defining and working with trait objects. And as we wrap up, there are a few things I want you to take with you. And the first is that, yes, traits are hard at first, but they are massively powerful and awesome once you get your head around them. Now, if you'd like to find out more about traits, and I hope you do, I use the Rust programming language book, the second edition, as my primary source for this project. Now, there are a lot of other really cool things you can do with traits that I didn't include in this talk for the sake of time. I highly encourage you to check out, in particular, chapters 10.2 and chapter 17.2 to see all the really cool things you can do with traits and prevent any pitfalls that might come from using traits. So, remember, if I can learn to harness the power of traits, then so can you. Thank you. <laughs>